when we think of the, the concept of idolatry, I think by and large our our first idea that comes to mind is someone, you know, a few thousand years ago bowing down to an idol that that's made of wood or that's that's made of stone. Maybe they're they're offering food to the idol, but but in the the idea in our minds that that, that is something relegated to the, the time and past, we would be incorrect. Did you know that there are 4,200 different religions practiced in the world today? 4,200 different religions. I, I looked up just a few moments ago, and Hinduism in and of itself, just, just on its own, has 320 million recognized deities. 320 million deities. God says of Himself in Isaiah chapter 45 and verse 5, I am the Lord, and there is no other. Besides me, there is... No God. He says in chapter 46 and verse 9, For I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me. Our task this morning is to establish the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as the only God, the God that deserves our worship, our praise, and our focus. Several hundred years before Isaiah would ever pen these words, David, King David, would pen perhaps the greatest treatise in history, of what it means to be God. And we find that in Psalm 139. If you would turn there, please. That's, that's where we're going to be spending the, the vast majority of our time together this morning. Psalm 139. In a time when His people were surrounded, tempted, and even inundated with idolatry, the Lord here presents His resume to be their only God. First of all, in verses 1-16 through 16 of Psalm 139, we see what David recognized. What David recognized in verses 1 through 16. First of all, in verses 1 through 6, God, David recognized God's omniscience. David recognized God's omniscience. It says, O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. Think with me for just a just a moment about the scope of, of God's knowledge. We learn in, in the Psalms, in Psalm 147, verse 4, that God numbers the stars. And he knows their names. Then we see in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 30 that, that even the, the number of hairs on our heads are numbered. Now I know that varies between different people in this room. But God knows the numbers of the hairs on our heads. And, and that passage would go on to illustrate the care that he has for us. And something that we'll notice as we read through this psalm this morning, we'll notice that that every aspect of God that, that David is going to emphasize is cast through David's own personal personal perspective. And that's why we see at least 48 different personal pronouns mentioned in this text. He's going to use words like I, me, and my 48 times in 24 verses. So this is a very personal psalm for David. But first of all, we see God's omniscience. He says, O Lord, You have searched me and You have known me. We learn in 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 7 that, that the Lord had indeed searched David and He had known him. We see in that text that that um, Samuel is presented before Jesse and Samuel is trying to decide, um, is, is looking through the sons of Jesse, trying to see who is going to be the next king of Israel. And, and the, the first son walks in and Samuel thinks, wow, this, this guy is king material. He's, he's big, he's strong, he's, he's handsome, he looks like a king. But do you remember what God says in that text? God says, no, Samuel, I'm not like a man that I, I look on the outward appearance. I am God, I, I look on the heart. And later on, and just a, just a few moments later, David walks through, and, and David is selected to be the next king of Israel. Because God had searched David, and He had known him personally. It says, you know when I sit down and when I rise up. First of all, God knows my moves. That is, the, the, the physical, the, the daily decisions that I make throughout my life, the, the places that I go, the things that I, I say and do. God knows my moves. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. Secondly, God knows my mind. You discern my thoughts from afar. Next, God knows my motives. In verse 3, you search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. In other words, God doesn't just know why I do. God doesn't just know the things that I do and the things that I say. He also knows why I do the things that I do. You remember the Pharisees in the New Testament, they looked great. They were doing all the things that they were supposed to do. But Jesus comes along and He exposes their true motivations 
for why they did those things. And because of their motivations, those things weren't accepted before God. So God knows my moves. He knows my mind. He knows my motives. But also in verse 4, He knows my mouth. Even before a word is, is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, You know it all together. The Lord knows all things. And the Lord knows all things about us personally. Finally, in verse 5, we see that, that David acknowledges God's authority that he has over him. He says, you hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. And then in verse 6, David, so David's comprised, he's, he's put all this, this energy and effort into to trying to communicate what it means that God knows all things. So he puts together all this information, then finally in verse 6, we see that he reacts to that information. He says, such knowledge is, is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain it. David recognized God's omniscience, the fact that he knew all things. But secondly, David also recognized God's omnipresence, that, that God was everywhere. In verses 7 and 8, we see that death cannot separate me from God. Death cannot separate me from God. David says, where shall I go from your spirit? Or, or where shall I, shall I flee from your presence? If I send you to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. I think that's, that's a great source of comfort for Christians. Don't you think so? That at some point in time, more than likely, each one of us in this room will be lying on our deathbeds. The, the time for death will come for each one of us individually. And at that point, we will realize that if we're faithful Christians, I am in God's presence now. And when I die, that's not going to change. I'll be in His presence after death as well. Death cannot separate me from God, but neither can distance. We see that in verses 9 and 10. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. And the phrase there he uses in verse 9, if I take the wings of the morning, that's referring to the speed of light, the speed that light travels as it's coming from the east. And then the next phrase, and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea. From David's vantage point, the uttermost parts of the sea were, were the far west. So in essence, what he's saying is, if I'm in the far east or if I'm in the far west, regardless of where I am, everywhere in between, God is. God is there. And that distance cannot separate me from God. So death, distance, but also darkness in verses 11 and 12. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. Think with me just for a moment about God's association with light in Scripture. We see it several times in, in, in a handful of books spread throughout Scripture that God is always associated with light. In Genesis chapter 1 and verse 3, for instance, He created light. We see in John chapter 8 and verse 12, Jesus said, I am the light. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 16, God says that He dwells in light. And because His Word takes on His attributes, we see that His Word is also light. Psalm 119 verse 105. God is associated with light. And we see that idea put even further in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 13. Whenever it says, No creature is hidden from His sight, but all are naked and exposed before Him. Our God knows all things, but secondly, our God is everywhere. God is, God is omnipresent. But then thirdly, God is omnipotent from verses 13 to 16. David says, For you formed my inward parts. You, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My, my frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret. Intricately woven in the depths of the earth, your your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your books were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. We see God's complete power in this text. In verse 13, we see that God played a very active role in each person's life before we were ever actually, before we were actually seen, possibly even before our parents knew that we existed. God was already very active in our lives. And then at the, the very end in verse 16, we see that, that God not only did was He instrumental in informing us and piecing us together very personally, but even further beyond that, we also see that He had, he had almost a, a book written with all of our days contained. He knew what our life would be like before we ever actually became a person. 
In verse 14, it says, I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. If you ever read any literature put out by the atheistic community, you'll notice that they're really charmed by the idea that from their perspective, the big that that life on earth came from stardust. They're, they're just really enchanted by this idea that as a result of the Big Bang, all the organic compounds eventually formed and eventually life came into being and all from stardust. And they just think that that's such a romantic idea. But, but friends, the, the truth is actually far better, don't you think? In Genesis chapter 1 and 2, we see that, that God personally, intimately formed the mud man that would become Adam out of the dust of the earth. He personally formed him. He personally made his, his body structure and the way that his face would look. Friends, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And that's so much more... The fact that, the fact that it's, it's deep and it's personal doesn't necessarily make it true. But the fact that it is true, the fact that God did form each one of us personally, He, he knitted us together in, in, in our mother's wombs, the fact that that took place makes it all the more significant. It says in verse... Um, In verse 15, the, the very last phrase of, of the verse, it says, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. This was a reference to the mother's womb. Um, at this point in time in history, during David's day, they, they didn't know a lot about the mother's womb, and so they referred to it in these dark and mysterious terms. So he refers to it here as, as the depths of the earth. So what David recognized, number one, God's omniscience, God's omnipresence, and then thirdly, God's omnipotence. In verses 17 and 18, we see a summary of this section. He says, How precious to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! If I would count them, they are more than the sand. I awake, and I am still with you. So in other words, David recognizes three different aspects of God's character, of who He is, and of His power. And then he comes down and he, he reflects on these things, he sums it up, and he's about to move on to a seemingly different, a different text. But we'll, we'll explain that in just a moment. We've seen what David recognized, but then number two, we'll see what David requested. In light of this, David is going to make some requests in verses 19 through 24. In 19 to 22, David requests God's justice. God's justice. He says, Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. O men of blood, depart from me. They speak against you with malicious intent. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with complete hatred. I count them my enemies. Now, something that we should, we should clarify very quickly. David's hate here is not an emotional outburst. It's, it's not wishing harm upon these individuals. David's hate is a judicial one. It's saying, because, because these people hate you, therefore, I can't have fellowship with these individuals. Because they speak evil against you, because they blaspheme your name, then therefore, I can't have a relationship with them and I wish that justice would be served. Why are they wicked? We see this in verse 19 and 20. Number one, they're men of blood. In other words, they're violent men. Number two, they're, they're men of malice in verse 20. And then number three, they're men of blasphemy, also in verse 20. So in the past 18 verses, David has been praising God. He's been lifting up his name. He's, he's been explaining how wonderful and, and awesome and mighty our God is. And the whole time that, that David has been building up God's character, the enemies of God has been smearing that character, has been blaspheming God, has been saying things against God's character and against His nature. So therefore, David says, because you are against God, you're also against me because I'm with God. So David says, if you are God's enemy, then also you are mine. So David requests God's justice in verses 19 to 22, and then in verses 23 and 24. We see that David requests God's evaluation. And I love this, I love this concept. He says in verse 23 and 24, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and, and know my thoughts. And see if there be any grievous way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. Think with me just for a moment. From verses 23 and 24, what do you think David's greatest fear was? What's David's greatest fear from verses 23 and 24? Based on these two verses, I would say that David's greatest fear is himself. Because compare the, the, the last two verses to the previous four. He's saying in light of the wickedness of these individuals, that's my greatest fear. I don't want to be God's enemy. That, that frightens me. 
to be on the wrong side of God's relationship. And, and so what does he say? God, I want you to search me. I want you to know my heart. I want you to, to compare my lifestyle to your standards and, and compare the two. And then I want you to show me where I'm wrong so that I can improve. So I can put that sinful lifestyle away so that, so that we can have a relationship with each other. David's greatest fear is himself. He knows that he has the potential to be God's enemy. He, he knows that God's enemies are around him. And David's greatest fear is being one of those enemies. And so what does he say? God, I want you to search me. I want you to know my heart. Amos, if you, if you look in, in the book of Amos, uh, the, one of the minor prophets, we, we see in chapter 7 that he used the illustration of a plumb line. You know what a plumb line is? That it's, it's a string with a weight at the end. And, and what it does is it tells you if something's straight up and down, right? And so in essence, what Amos does is he compares the Israelite people to a wall. And he says this wall is crooked. And God brings a plumb line and he compares the wall to that plumb line. Well, friends, we're the wall. We need to allow ourselves to be compared to God's standard. And if I don't, if I don't mesh up, if I'm crooked, I need to fix that. Because until I do, I'm going to be counted as God's, as God's enemy. And this really is, is the, the beauty of confession. We talked about confession some last week. But the beauty of confession is that it reveals, it reveals a heart that wants to do right, doesn't it? If I'm willing to confess my fault, if, I, if I'm willing to, to freely admit the things that I've done wrong, in essence I'm saying I've done wrong and I, I, want, to make, I want to make restoration. I want, to, I want to be brought back into a right relationship with God. I don't want to do those things anymore. But as long as I'm self-righteous, as long as I, I'm puffed up in pride, I'm never going to confess my sins. I, I'm never going to compare myself to God's standard. I'm never going to do the things that he's, he's asked me to do. David desperately fears becoming like the men in verses 19 to 22. And so he puts full dependence on God to lead him in the way of everlasting. Let's notice the, the flow of the text. In the first 18 verses, again, David is, David is in awe of God's power. He, he celebrates the fact that God is in every place, that God is all-powerful, and that God knows all things. But he says, based on this, at the same time that I'm celebrating these, these wonderful attributes of God, someone, these wicked men, these individuals, are, are out defaming God's character. They're smearing God's character. And he prays for justice on these individuals. And then in light of that, in light of those, those wicked individuals and the justice that will soon come upon them, he says, I don't want to be one of those people. I want to react to the three attributes that we've just seen, and I want to live accordingly. I, I want to be right before God, and, and I want to, to live in such a way that I'm, I'm meshing with His standards, that, I, that I'm straight up and down in the way that God would have me to be. But the three traits that we just noticed, think about the different perspectives. Think of the, the three attributes of God from the perspective of a wicked person. From a person in verses 19 to 22, how does a wicked person see those attributes of God? A wicked person doesn't like the fact that God is in every place. Because if God is in every place, then He knows what I'm doing. He, he knows what I'm, what I'm thinking. He knows what I'm saying. The wicked person doesn't like the fact that, that God is all-powerful because someday that all-powerful God can bring me into judgment for the things that He's seen me do. He doesn't like the fact that, that God knows all things because He can bring justice. But now flip that around. And think about the comfort that we find as, as people that are striving to be straight up and down by God's standards. Think about the comfort that we find in the fact that, that before we were ever formed in the womb, God knew what our lives would consist of. God knew where our valleys would be. He, he knew where our mountaintops would be. And He's going to be with us the whole way. That death cannot separate me from God. And darkness and distance, nothing can come between me and God, think about how comforting that is for a righteous person. That God does know all things and He knows that I'm trying and He knows that I'm doing the best I can to walk in the narrow way. And, and so because I'm doing the best I can and I'm walking in the light, then, then God is going to judge me accordingly. That God is everywhere, that He does know all things and that He, he does love us. Eventually, the rest of the story, we find that, that David's requests were granted. He requested justice and and while that justice may not necessarily take place in this life, it will in the next. See in Hebrews, uh, rather 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 8, 
that God will in flaming fire take vengeance on those who do not know Him. But then also that, that request for, for evaluation, that God fulfilled that too. God evaluates each one of us. He searches us and He knows us. He did that for David and He does that for us as well. If you will, let us bow. Heavenly Father, we are in awe of Your omnipotence, Your omnipresence, and Your omniscience. The fact that You know everything, that You are everywhere, and that You care for us. This humbles us, dear Lord, and we pray that You will search us, You will know us, that You will show us through Your Word, dear Lord, the, the ways that we have failed You, so that we can make restoration, so that we can be the people that You have called us to be. Forgive us of our sins, dear Lord, and, and again, show us in our lives those things that are amiss, so that we can be strengthened, so that we can look to You, and so that we can, we can do better in the future. Thank you so much for the blessing of your Son. We ask this name in the name of Jesus. Amen. There is no God like our God. There's no one like Him. There is no one else that is omniscient, that, that knows everything, that's in every place, that, that has all power. And because that God has all power, He's able to forgive us of our sins. He's able to make that restoration. He's able to bridge that gap that was formed whenever sin came into our lives, whenever we, need, whenever we were in that position that we were living in the, the futility that we talked about in our Bible class, God is able to remove that and transplant us into the kingdom of His Son. If you're here this morning, and you haven't come into a right relationship with God, that you are on the other side of that plumb line, and, and you realize that you're more carefully aligned with the, the wicked individual than with David, it's possible for us to come back into that relationship. But we need to hear the Word of God preached and, and believe that God exists and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6. Upon doing that, I need to repent of my sins. I've been confronted by the Word and I need to respond by, by making that, that, that godly sorrow that we talked about last week. Once I repent of my sins, I actually confess that Jesus is the Son of God. Romans chapter 10 and verse 10. And then I see that I need to be baptized for remission of my sins because baptism does also now save us. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21. It's at that point in time that we come up from baptism that, that God is going to add us into the kingdom of His Son. Acts chapter 2 and verse 47. If you've already done these things, but you've fallen away. It's possible to come back. It's, it's always possible to come back with God. As long as we have life, as long as we have breath in our bodies, it's possible to, to come back. And to be restored to God. If you have a need this morning, please come as we stand and as we sing. Just stand.